If you've been paying attention to the news recently, there's probably one word you've heard over and over and over again. Every public health official says, testing, testing, testing. 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 Testing, 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 testing. While most of us now understand how important this is given our scenario, not many of us actually know how the test works. The science behind testing for the presence of a viral infection in the human body is truly fascinating and massively pertinent to current events. So grab your mask, get some sanitizer, and let's get into it. In this video, we're going to look at a plethora of methods to test people for viral infections, starting with PCR. This is one of the most widespread, accurate, and direct tests available. The first thing we need to understand is the structure of a virus. A virus usually comprises of three parts. A capsid, which is a hard outer coating on the virus. Genetic material, usually comprised of DNA or RNA. And surface proteins on the capsid. The genetic material, or RNA, is like a barcode or a fingerprint and is different and unique for every single virus. If you look closely, you realize that the RNA is just a super long sequence of molecules called bases, which come in four different flavors, adenosine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine, or A, U, C, and G for short. These base molecules can be positioned in any order and can be linked up in a chain many, many thousands of molecules long. What's key to understand is that the order of these base molecules is the same for all viruses of the same strain. Thus, if scientists know the sequence of bases for a virus, they can look for that specific sequence in patients to see if a patient has been infected by a virus. To do so, they first need a sample. Respiratory viruses usually present in a patient's airways, saliva, and mucus instead of the blood, which is why you often see doctors and nurses using swabs and not blood tests. Once doctors have a sample of the virus, they can search that sample to see if the RNA present in that sample matches what they are looking for. But searching for viral RNA can be really tricky, and sometimes they hide in plain sight. To make the search easier, scientists make many, many copies of the sample, amplifying their chances of spotting the RNA that they're looking for. This is done by a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. In this process, scientists target a small portion of the RNA and cut it out of the entire RNA chain. This target fragment is then replicated over and over again until there's enough for it to be easily sequenced. Sequencing the resulting RNA and comparing it to the virus allows scientists to confirm whether or not a person is infected. As a quick side note, if you want to learn more about how PCR and gene sequencing work, let us know in the comments below. They're really cool topics and we'd love to make videos about them. Next up, let's look at isothermal nucleic acid amplification arrays. These are being widely studied right now, since they could provide a much faster and much cheaper test than PCR. The overall process that this method follows is similar to PCR. You start with a swab to obtain a sample, amplify any RNA that may be present in the sample, sequence the resulting RNA, and then compare that to the RNA of the virus that you are looking for. Another method to identify if a patient has been infected with a viral disease is antigen testing. This can be a great way to ramp up testing capabilities for a virus, as PCR is super accurate but very slow, and INAA machines can only process one sample at a time, while antigen testing can be done en masse in many many labs across the world. An antigen test works by trying to identify proteins in a virus instead of the RNA. For example, one can look at surface spike proteins to identify a virus. Once a sample has been obtained from a patient, the sample is exposed to antibodies. Antibodies are specific to each antigen protein, like a key to a lock, giving antigen tests the potential to be incredibly accurate. 
Moving on, medical imaging is another method by which we can diagnose patients with a viral infection. Viruses like influenza, SARS, Deer. etc. often lead to pneumonia. This is sometimes visible on chest x-rays, helping doctors identify if an infection is present. However, this is not always accurate, as respiratory infections don't always lead to visible changes in a patient's lungs. For example, you could test positive for the flu but have absolutely no pneumonia. So far, we've looked at tests that identify whether a patient is currently infected. Another piece of information that could be important when looking at viral diseases is seeing if a patient had a disease in the past. Instead of looking directly for a virus, these tests look for a body's response to the virus. One such way to investigate past infections is a serological test. These rely on using a blood sample instead of a swab test. When our bodies fight infections, they produce antibodies that are specific to the disease we have. In the case of the Here. virus, for example, patients primarily produce two antibodies called immunoglobin M, or IgM for short, and immunoglobin G, or IgG for short. And these are usually most visible one week and two weeks after the infection, respectively. To check for the presence of these antibodies, reagents are added to blood samples and then looked at under an analyzer. Positive results are often identified as they glow brightly in fluorescent colors when exposed to certain wavelengths of light, such as ultraviolet light. There is a chance that the presence of antibodies can lead to immunity from a strain of a virus, but this is different for every virus. And given our current situation, we simply don't know enough to be able to say whether or not antibodies can lead to long-term immunity. All right, so that about sums up our discussion of different ways to test for viral infections. Each method has pros and cons, and honestly, it's amazing to see that science is able to give us so many options to identify whether someone is sick or not. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked that video. If you did, smash the like button and share the video with others who might be interested. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. To watch more videos, click on any of these two on your screen right now.